Hey, good morning. Cole, what's going on, man? Oh, nothing much. Can you uh, hear me all right? Yeah, how about me on your end? Oh, yeah, like good. a pro. Awesome. I'm trying to get better at that. <laughs> Thank- Sweet. Thanks for starting the day doing a podcast. Really appreciate it. And sick background. Your place looks awesome. Oh, thanks. Yeah, man, of course. Thanks for having me on. Stoked it, to be here. Yes. I've uh, kind of first started following you, I think, maybe after Mid-South in 2022, I want to say. Um, I think kind of, I don't know as much about the mountain bike world, but then as you've been doing the gravel thing, kind of popping up on the radar and yeah, I just was reading some different things about you. And so, yeah, I really appreciate you sitting down to kind of pull back the curtain of you as a cyclist. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, Mid-South was a good one. So what's the, so your Instagram profile, mountain biker that races gravel. So you a gravel cyclist or are you still a mountain biker at heart or what's the like, tell, tell, <laughs> actually, this will be the first question. Who are you? Who are yeah. you as a cyclist? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that like, I'm still trying to figure that out too, but um, I like to definitely, uh, call myself a mountain biker. That's where my roots come from. Um, all through the junior ranks in my U23 years, I was racing cross country mountain bikes. Um, and that's what really kind of, um, started my love for cycling was the mountain bike. Um, and then recently we had this huge wave of gravel going on in the States and kind of globally. And that's where, uh, a lot of the opportunity for racing has come up. So, I think uh, myself and a lot of my peers have been kind of drawn into this gravel scene um, and found quite a bit of success in it too. Um, So it's kind of like, well, I don't think we're gravel riders, but we are, but really we're mountain bikers. So yeah, hence uh, that's, that's kind of my bio, just a mountain biker that races gravel, but, uh, but yeah, still trying to figure it out. That's funny because then I guess I feel less of a poser being like the roadie that races gravel. I guess maybe a lot of us are just meeting in the middle there. I'm like, like, oh, you ride off road stuff? I'm like, no, nah, no. I'm like, if it's <laughs> no, are there are the rocks very big? Because I probably shouldn't be here if that happens. So, yeah, it's uh-huh. and uh, is it four national championships you've got on the mountain bike? Yeah, collegiate, collegiate, four, four collegiate national titles. Yep, awesome. That's amazing. Well, I think one, I'm always interested on people that have different disciplines and how you kind of look at the year. And and let's say, I think this is a really kind of big question to start off with, but how do you look at your training calendar as you're coming into the season? Do you do, do you have like a base phase? Do you have, how do you like look at the targets as you're going into the year? Do, you know, sometimes races get canceled or a new race pops up in gravel. It's like, oh, hey, there's this new race with this prize. Like, how do you shift things? So I guess my first question would be, what do you do sort of like preseason to get ready? Are you like a big volume guy? Do you do intervals? What's, what's your go-to? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, everything has changed quite a bit for me in the last couple of seasons because um, I have been doing a lot more of this, these endurance events and these longer events. So my whole focus as an athlete has been just to kind of build my endurance tank. Mm. Um, and so in the early season, I'm just doing tons of volume. Um, my girlfriend and I went to Spain and we spent the winter there and I was just logging really long hours. Um I threw in a few like fun local races over there to kind of keep the speed in my legs. But really, I was just putting in as much time as I could, um, could at least handle and adapt to. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah, the the whole planning out the season calendar, that's like the biggest puzzle um, of the year. And I'm super lucky to to have a really good coach that I can work with on kind of strategically planning that out and planning out different rest phases throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Um and then travel like my whole life is just like this massive logistical plan of of where i'm going to be if i'm going to be at altitude or sea level um how long i'm going to be training when when i should take a rest period um and all that and that's all just contingent um kind of on what races i'm doing and and honestly how i'm feeling and it kind of adapts as we go to Yeah, it's like it's a moving target. And I've I've never really considered that for I've been talking to more and more athletes that are on the road like you guys are. And you mentioned somewhere else like this. uh, I think it was one of your Instagram reels, like you're kind of this traveling group of 
athlete yeah. to go event to event and uh great if people haven't been to cole's instagram page definitely check it out really like top-notch production on the reels and like you've definitely put some time and effort in i think it's awesome and that's interesting like thinking of the altitude and where you're going to train before that and where are you the week before this and then what's the travel to the next race and so it's like logistically it's got to get crazy and so that gives your coach uh definitely a few more like puzzling things totally. to scratch over who who's your coach yeah, my coach is Dennis Van Winden. Um, he's a former World Tour Road Pro. Um, he lives in Spain right now. And I got in contact with him through Orange Seal, um, one of my main sponsors. And he is kind of the performance director for their academy, which is um, basically a group of athletes that they offer resources to um, with coaching and mechanical support at races. So it's, That's it's cool. a great group and yeah, I've been working with Dennis now for two years. So it's awesome. been good. Shout out to Dennis. I'm always curious. Uh, yeah. I like to reach out to different coaches to get them on the podcast too, just because especially a rider like him with that amount of experience, just he's forgotten more stuff than most of us will ever learn or get to learn. So yeah, it's cool to hear their perspective. When you're doing those big uh, volume blocks in the base period, what kind of metrics do you focus on? Heart rate, power, RPE, combination of the three, or maybe something totally different? Yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. So uh, mainly we're focusing, we, we do both heart rate and power, but most of my zones and training is broken down with power. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like the metric that I can, can look at during intervals and training. Um, but a lot of times, uh, like let's say I'm having a bad day or uh, another big time is like when I'm at altitude, I like to just like forget looking at any data screen and just focus on RPE and writing off sensations because so much can change. And like, I found that a lot of times power um, doesn't really do anything for me, but kind of like hold me back in a way that like if i'm having a bad day i just see that those numbers and i'm not hitting them and i'm getting really frustrated and it's just distracting me from like the actual purpose of the workout um or if i'm having a really good day and it's coming really easy it's like well then maybe i'm not pushing myself hard enough um and so and then it's also kind of just this uh, this exercise of like actually tuning into your body and and understanding like okay this is my threshold like this is what it feels to ride threshold not like i need to ride this number and that is threshold um because it can always change mm -hmm. based on on how you're recovering from your training or like i said if you're at altitude like all of a sudden your numbers are super low mm -hmm. um and as you climb up in altitude they get even lower so that can just be so frustrating that's you had made a comment it might have been on the giant website of what do you do during hard sessions and you had i love it was the shortest but like a huge sentence of saying i refocus the mind and find the flow state without me putting words into your mouth what is, is that kind of what you were just referring to like not getting too caught up in the numbers and like just flowing with what the day is providing you like be in the moment or how do you sort of see that i love that answer i think it's very um <laughs> I don't think Zen is the word, but you know where I'm going. Yeah, no, for sure. That's kind of like, honestly, what I've been working on, kind of my motto is like finding that Zen um, in training or just in the suffering. And um, I think that there's just like so much noise when you're really pushing yourself. And if you can just like realize that like, oh, you're in a safe place, like you're, you're supposed to be feeling this way. Like you're kind of like hunting for discomfort when you're training. And when you do feel like, I don't know if I can push any harder, then, uh, then you know you're in the right spot. So mm -hmm. you just have to refocus. I like to refocus on my breath and just like really know that I'm doing the right thing. Like that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to get to that point of like, I don't know if I can go any harder. When you focus on your breath, do you do any breath work off the bike or kind of going on that? You're a lot of people don't talk about breathing, which I think is a really important yeah. thing, but yeah, no, I do a ton of breath work actually. Um, I'm doing it like, um, I use this little AeroFit device. Uh, <laughs> I, like, people, I swear to God, I did not plug this. Good. I swear to oh, God, yeah, <laughs> nice, yeah. So I'm like, I'm all in with breath work. Um, I'm That's using it when I, 
when I'm like on the foam roller, um, like uh, breathing in four seconds and then like contracting my muscles and holding my breath for four seconds and then releasing for eight. Um, and then like, obviously like when I'm training, I'm just always focusing on the breath. Cause like, um, in my opinion, like the two things that you can control when you're training or racing is, uh, your breath and then the line that you're taking. And so whenever I'm like struggling or getting distracted, I just like always try to refocus on those two things. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've, I've spent a ton of time up at super high altitude this year. So you have to be really in tune with your breath. That's amazing. Yeah. I, it's funny because somebody asked me one time, they're like, okay, man, if this thing works, why is everyone not doing it? I said, cause honestly it sucks to breathe into a device for 15 oh. minutes a day. Like it's extra work that when I'm tired, I'm like, oh, dude. but I know the benefits yeah. of it. So it's like, that's why everybody doesn't do it. It's like, it's another little yeah. thing to add onto the list of like all the things you got to do. So yeah, yeah. Cool. no, it's brutal. I think like the thing I learned most with the AeroFit <laughs> is just like, you can breathe so deep. You can breathe down into your back and your ribs. You know, it's like that, just that, like the motion of that, or it, it's, it's huge. Yeah. It's a, it's a big deal. What is, um, uh, uh, this actually would be two parts, I guess, base training phase. Are you in the gym at all? And if so, kind of what are you doing? And then if the answer is yes, do you continue that all year long? Yeah, I do pretty minimal time in the gym. Um, this this year in base season i spent most of the time just working on some imbalances i had um and that's usually the extent of what i'm doing i have this uh, a weak glute uh, medius and so i've been doing a lot of just uh, strengthening that like really targeted exercises for that to try to balance it out um and then before any like intensity or races um I do a, an activation routine. It's it's only like twelve minutes, super exact, but um, it's something that I can just. What's that? Is it the right foot forward, left foot back video? No, <laughs> no, because that's exactly uh, twelve minutes. So I'm like, no way. It's yeah, uh, I think Grant <laughs> Koontz is like a huge fan of that one. But yeah, which one? What are you doing? What's the routine? Uh, it's a lot of just like um like I have this elastic band that I put around my knees. It's a lot of just kind of like resistance training, just activating um, specific muscle groups, nothing much to really build strength, but more just to to activate the muscles and get them ready um, before I hop on the bike. And uh, it's 12 minutes because it's short and uh, it's something that I'll actually do. If it's any longer, then I'm usually like, i don't know about this and if it's any shorter then it's just easy to skip so Mm. that's kind of what i found to be good for me awesome what's your what are some of your favorite workouts to do what do you and maybe it's like an endurance drive like what type of riding do you really love to do like what's your default if you were just uh able to pick anything yeah i love sprint workouts i really uh, did not see that uh, coming I know now that I'm an endurance (laughs) athlete, it's like, what? But, uh, I just love going fast. I love going fast and I love going all out. Like there's just no question to it. It's just as hard as you can go. Um, and as fast as you can go, you know, for a certain amount of time. And I love doing it with a group with some people and, and, you know, you start to get competitive, but yeah, sprint workouts are fun for me. And I think you've answered this before on another interview somewhere, like you're more into the a group, a ride with friends as opposed to a solo ride, or has that changed at all? No, I love riding with groups. Um, like, I feel like that's kind of like um, my only social time these days too. It's like <laughs> group rides with friends. Um, and I have a lot of great people to train with. Um, I've been able to kind of, put myself in these different cycling communities um, where I have lots of peers and really strong riders to go out with. Um, And I just, I just enjoy the heck out of it. I love having a group, a big group ride. I think that stemmed from college in collegiate cycling where we just have like, you know, a group of 10 just shredders and we'd go out and train together. And yeah, I love, I love that part of the sport. I'm so envious of collegiate cycling. I was not a cyclist in college. And it's like, so people have so many good stories about collegiate cycling that I'm just like, oh man, if I can go back in time, that's the one thing I want to like, everybody get in the van. We're going to this race this weekend. Like just the stories that rip from it are amazing. Oh, it's so good. 
Yeah. So aside from having people that motivate you and a group, what do you think is one of the number one things that's gotten you to where you are as a fast cyclist? Ah, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think it's like, oh, it's so many things, but probably well, just actually, it doesn't have to be one it, it, it more. Yeah. Yeah. What okay. Okay. Had? Yeah. I mean, I've had a lot of great coaches and, oh. and I feel like I've, I've taken what I've learned from, from all of these different coaches and kind of um, figured out what works for me best and just, and, and yeah, used it, used it as much as I could. But um, I, I feel like I'm also kind of like a sponge. Like I'm always looking into what other people are doing and testing it on myself, trying to figure out if it's helpful or not. Um, and then also my peers too, and their training. Um, but yeah, I think consistency is the biggest thing. It's like so many people will train super hard and then get burnt out and then, you know, not have very quality training for a long time. And I think it, you're walking that fine line of being overtrained. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, the biggest thing is just being consistent, not not even just like over one season, but multiple seasons, just continuing that growth. And um, And I think I've done that really well and I haven't really towed over that too much um so hopefully i just keep that trajectory going upward do you ever find it in looking around at like hey this is what this person is doing this is what this person's doing has it ever become distracting for you since now with like strava and obviously the internet and insert we have access to so many people's training has it ever kind of made you overthink what you're doing and been like man am i doing the right thing or do you just try and get a flavor for what people are doing like how do you incorporate that because i think it can be especially like for athletes that might be self-coached that listen to this it's like wait this person's doing that wait this person's doing that it's like oh wait and then you kind of doubt yourself do you ever get that or you kind of just like how do you manage that oh yeah no you're spot on totally that totally happens to me i actually um stopped uploading my rides to strava this year really because i was just like it, it's just noise it's just like chatter for me and and i like totally get way too sucked into it mm. um i've been working with my sports psychologist and she's like dude you got to get off strava like this is not helping you at all um and and i don't think it was necessarily like um like i'm looking too much into other people's writing but more so like I feel like I need to be putting out like the, like these crazy big rides and crazy big trainings and going for these really big KOM segments. And if I come up short on them, then like, then, and then I failed, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was just like another thing that's just holding me back and not helping me because uh, like, it's not going to help me to ride 30 more minutes on a training ride just to hit that like yeah. six hours or seven hours, you know? So um, yeah, being off Strava has actually helped me a lot. Um, and like, I, I catch myself every, every once in a while, like scrolling on Strava, looking at other people's stuff. And I'm like, okay, what are you doing? Like, let's stop comparing. Let's just, let's just focus on what I need to focus on. I love your candor in that. And that's, I fell into that trap of KOMs and have, I recently moved in the past year and a half. So it was like all new KOMs. And I'm like, going for them too often and then in my heart of hearts i'm like man you have no none of like the power you need at the end of the race like you're worried about these stupid koms I'm like no like, yeah just today i'll do these ones and it definitely bit me um and so i've been yeah. trying to moderate my own strava usage and the feedback of not getting the kudos for getting koms and just trying to be like do the workout yeah you know, move forward so what do you, well, so you, I was actually going to ask you, maybe have you done anything that slowed you down before? And maybe that's sort of the answer, maybe getting too, maybe, maybe what you just said, too into the social media side of cycling. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy how it's blowing up now. It's like everywhere. I know. I know. I mean, I love it. I love Strava and like in my, in the off season and base season, it's a huge part of my training, just like going for it, going for segments and things. And, and it's rewarding to see your hours stack up, but, um, but yeah, I think that definitely holds me back. Um, I think power sometimes can hold me back being too focused on that. Um, and then just overtraining too. That's like the biggest one. Um, my build up for unbound this year, I was like feeling amazing, put in, um, a couple really big weeks and then, uh, then I got sick and mm -hmm. I was super sick for like 
almost a month. Um, and that, that really dug a hole in my season. So that's like, that's the main one is, is illness, um, Mm -hmm. from just putting in too much work. Well, as you said, you're looking at the big picture. You learned a great lesson from this. You'll take it moving forward with your coach and you know, it'll be, it, it, yeah, the, that small bump will just be a minor thing in the rear view mirror down the road. So, you know, mm-hmm. what's a bomb, any challenges off the bike that you've overcome that's helped you become a better athlete? Um, yeah, like I think um well Sevilla, my girlfriend and i we started um kind of out of college we had just got we have just graduated um and we are trying to to make it to go pro and we we both had contracts at the time and this is right when uh covid hit and um and our our contracts were dropped um and so i think that was like a really big time for both of us to like um to really lean into like the sport or kind of go a different direction and start working and um i i almost stopped racing at that point and Sevilla kind of was the one that that kind of kicked me in the ass and was like hey like you you have what it takes like you got to keep going um and so i think it's like times like that um that that was a huge one and then another uh moment was this year i started my own privateer program and i think like all that work off the bike to like put together a program um where that that gives you enough support to really um fund your your goals um in your whole racing calendar i think that's huge uh it it really helps me it helps me feel like i'm invested in this sport and then, uh, and then when I'm training and racing, then it's just so much more rewarding because it's like, oh, I've worked for this. Like I've done all this work on the back end to, to try to get to where I want to go. And now it's just time to ride my bike. Um, and so that, that really helps me, um, kind of just like be really committed to what I'm doing. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. I think that's definitely valuable for other athletes that might be finding themselves in your shoes too. You know, I think coming out of school and it's like, do I, do I go after this? Do I go get more of a normal job? Like, how do I do this? And especially for someone that might not have like an entrepreneurial sort of natural sense, they could struggle with that. But hearing you go through it, do it kind of maybe, ah, maybe I shouldn't do this. And someone's like, you got to keep going. I mean, I'm glad you kept going. You're crushing. So it's like, hopefully you keep reminding yourself of that. What do you think is, your best attribute in cycling and how do you use that to your advantage in these gravel races? Yeah, I think it's, or it's, it's definitely my handling skills, like uh, coming from the mountain bike side of things, just you have so much uh, time kind of off road Mm -hmm. and uh, in kind of technical chunky bits. And so uh, we get to these gravel races and, and all of a sudden everyone around you can't corner on loose stuff or something and it's like oh wow that's that there's my skill right there Mm -hmm. um but it is super hard uh uh, i mean a lot of these races aren't very technical they're not very loose um so you have to be kind of crafty about or i have to be kind of crafty about where i use my skills and and how i use them and i think i'm still definitely learning i think in in the first few gravel races i did i was like okay anytime it goes downhill like i gotta just like attack and like put pressure on and go for it and then like i'd go for it and uh still have what like 80 miles left and be out you know in no man's land and everyone i'm sure is making fun of me so i'm learning how to how to kind of cater my skills to my to my benefit and i think a lot of the time it's like okay if i'm gonna if i can take corners faster and like technical downhills faster then i'm going to use those sections to recover like i'll stay in the group but i'm just going to focus on breathing i'm going to try to get my heart rate down as low as possible and i'll just know that i'm recovering more than everyone around me Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how i can use that to my advantage and then maybe maybe there'll be an opportunity later in the race that i could you know send it but we'll see 
Man, I think though, I don't think people are laughing at you because I know any I've moved to being a roadie that cannot descend on gravel. There are races here that I will just get dropped, like hands down. I'm gonna lose a couple minutes on some of these downhills. These guys are just ripping, and I ride up if they wait up. I'm like, you mountain bike, huh? They're like, yeah, and motocross. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, because I was wondering how the hell you went down so fast. So I'm yeah. like the worst part of the country for my style of riding. And I don't laugh at those guys, even if they wait up, I'm more like damn i like we cannot, <laughs> there cannot be a downhill anywhere near the finish where the race is over so like kind of makes me more nervous so i think just send i mean you're not wasting much energy but, uh yeah it's more of an intimidation factor i think to those of us who cannot handle the bike like you can <laughs> so having that strength on the flip side what do you want to improve the most on this season yeah um just my endurance like that's the main thing coming from cross country uh, our races were an hour and a half, pretty much max time. Um, and so now we're doing races that are six hours, seven unbound is 11. Um, so it's, it's super hard. Like my whole training has, has changed to try to get me to just build that, that diesel engine more. Um, and, and I definitely noticed like, I'll feel really good for the first half of most of these races. Then the second half, I'm just hanging on and doing every little thing possible to save energy um so so yeah i'm just trying to build my engine my fatigue resistance is what uh we're working on mm -hmm. um so i'll do really long race or really long training rides and then a bunch of vo2 intervals in the last hour or so okay. and um that's kind of the system that we've been trying to train and and uh get up to speed go in on that a little bit more what kind of vo2 max intervals will you do is it does it change is it like the same like hey go ride four hours and do these or what's the uh, recipe there yeah usually we'll do like um we'll do some intervals in the first hour um like maybe like a 20 minute a couple 20 minute uh threshold intervals um mm -hmm. just to burn a, through a bunch of kilojoules and then i'll go ride endurance for like three or four hours and then in the final hour i'll do like three five minute at as hard as i can go yeah. or three four minutes um just to get that intensity in right at when i burn through like four thousand kjs or something awesome um, so do you brutal, do any but... say it again i said brutal but awesome. it, it sounds brutal oh my god you don't yeah. want that workout but I mean, even uh, Riley Sheen was just on and he was talking about how he does a lot of his intervals at the end of the day, just because it's so race specific for what he's doing. And um, always he's like, I put in 2000 KJs and I go do these. And it's interesting how certain people are into that. Some people aren't as much. Um, where do you sort of stand in your coach on doing like really long tempo or like low threshold stuff? Do you do that? Cause I, I'm hearing more like threshold VO2 max, like the high intensity stuff. Where are you in that like moderato range? Yeah. Yeah. We actually just started introducing that, uh, in the last couple months, especially when I was up at altitude. Um, I think I'm finally at the point where I can, uh, kind of train into that energy system and take in, in that kind of tempo, low threshold. Um, and yeah, it's nice. It's, uh, it's just kind of like, I, I honestly, I hate that kind of stuff because you're just like, you're just uncomfortable. You're not really like pushing super hard mm -hmm. and you're not riding endurance, but you're just like in that uncom discomfort zone. Mm -hmm. um but while we were up at altitude i was doing a bunch kind of training for uh, my big block for leadville 100 um we were doing a lot of that stuff because a lot of that race is you are sitting in tempo mm -hmm. cool um looking more on like the micro on the day-to-day -day of your training and just living as an athlete is there anything any number one thing in your daily routine that you think shows the biggest return to success as an athlete I mean, I can't like talk about the importance of recovery enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's huge and something that like, I feel like I can always be doing more. Um, I like the, the purpose of training is to adapt. And like, if you're not recovering, you're not adapting to your training. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like something that I've really learned over the last couple of years is like recovery is not necessarily like uh, doing 
like stretching or foam rolling or going to yoga or whatever. It's literally just doing nothing like couch time, just sitting down, chilling, like trying to minimize the, your output as much as possible. Mm. And so like at, when I'm training super hard, it's, re- it's, it's hard because I'm out there all day and like I get back and have a bunch of things to do. But like the most important thing is just to be like very just like couch locked, doing nothing, trying to absorb that, getting ready for the next day. Um, and, and that's really helped me. It's like, okay, I have to start saying no to all these things. Like, no, I can't, can't go hang out with friends. No, like I'm not gonna make this extravagant meal or whatever, or go watch a movie or something. I just gotta like chill and do nothing, say nothing. <laughs> I always like the statement. I don't know who actually started this, but uh, it's not overtrained; it's under recovered. And I was like, yeah. "That's really well said." Like, it's just—I mean, I remember when I first started riding, I thought a rest week. I was like, "Oh, there's no workouts. Like, this is the time to go out and party." My coach was like, "Dude, what do you wait? What did you do last night? No, man, uh-huh. like, you need to be soaking <laughs> in all of that hard work. This is not the time to go and like play." I was like, oh, "Okay, like, good lesson yeah. learned." So. It's so hard. It takes so much control, but it's so important. So you've dropped a ton of gems. What is one of the best gems that someone's ever told you, like the best piece of advice that you've ever received? And it doesn't have to be cycling related, but just something you've kind of carried with you throughout the years. Yeah. Uh, th- this one just like, it, it has a lot of sentiment for me. Um, but so my coach, Dennis, uh, the first year I started working with him, he used to come and race some of the gravel races. Uh, like he was second at mid South that, that year that I won mm, and sick. we raced that together. Yeah. So it was sweet. That's so um, cool. I'm trying to convince him to come back and race a little bit this fall, but anyway, uh, something he'd always tell me is like, hold your horses, hold your horses. And like coming from my background in, in mountain biking, there's no holding your horses. It's just full gas all the time. But like, um, it, it has a lot more meaning than just in a race scenario. And and he continues to tell me like, hold your horses in training because it's so easy to go too hard. And um, it's so easy to just push it when you feel good. And, and when, when you want to go or if you're riding with some buddies, throwing in just like pointless attacks for, for whatever reason. Um, and I get sucked into all that stuff all the time. So um, I always have his his voice in the back of my head, kind of in, in a loop, like, hold your horses, hold your horses. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really helped me for for the days when when we do go hard, then I'm ready to go hard and, and ready to go instead of just like always pushing it a little bit too much. Mm-hmm. I love to hear you say that. There was uh, Patchy Vila, who's head of Movistar Performance, was on maybe a couple months ago, and he was talking about – you know, how as athletes, we sometimes want to like just check in on our fitness. Like we go do this endurance, right? It's like, damn, I, I'm just going to go do this five minute effort to see like where my numbers are at. And yeah, I don't know what the physiological toll is on that, but I also think yeah. it's something mental. Then you're not, as you said, then you're not ready when you really need to go hard on that big, hard day. And yeah. it's hard to tell people like, don't go waste that 30 second effort. They're like, well, what do, what big deal is make? I'm like, it, ugh it makes a difference. Like, I don't know exactly why, but like all those little things added up, they take away from the really key sessions. So to hear you say that, hear something from Movistar say like it, it, it just, it matters. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's 100%. Easy. It's e- and if you like the group rides, like you said, it's hard not to, when your buddies oh, are like, come yeah. on, let's go, let's go Cole. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let's let's uh, I'm curious, let's shift into some nutrition stuff. What are you doing on the bike? And maybe we could break it into you're doing big, long rides. And then let's talk about a six hour gravel race and get as granular as you can, because people are like curious down to the carb. Um, so okay. big, long training ride. What are you doing? Yeah, um, I do like the thing is. I mix it up so much because I'm not one of those, those athletes that can just eat the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just like constantly getting different bars. Um, I'm, I'm super fortunate to be working with the feed Mm -hmm. so I can just like test out flavors, do all sorts of different things. Uh, recently, I guess my favorite bars are, uh, the Morton solid bars. I think they're just like, 
super good fuel. They taste really good. They fit in the Jersey pocket. Well, um, but I've also been using like Joe J bars, um, the cliff nutter butter bars. Um, and then a lot of times when I'm just like sick of bars, I'll make my own rice cakes mm. and the rice cakes are really good cause they're low glycemic. So for longer rides, when you don't want to be just like burning through quick sugars, um, having, having something that's a little bit slower is better. Um, I, I love, um, Alan Lim's, uh, bacon and eggs, rice cake recipe. That's like the, my go-to it's like bacon, eggs, soy sauce, brown sugar, rice, mm -hmm. super simple. Um, I, I like always make those when I have a big block. Um, and then usually like I'll bring a few little, like maybe uh some chews for like the final hour of my ride as like a little treat yeah. um, on those long days and uh, i use a mixture um right now i'm really loving uh precision fuels chews they're 30 grams each um and they taste like little turkish delights um Ooh. so yeah That's i love nice. them um but yeah i'm using a mixture and like i think the biggest thing for me is just like looking forward to what i'm gonna eat so like always having something new um and and that's kind of that's what i usually do i don't do a whole lot of drink mix um just because i i've found that like a super high carb drink mix will kind of dehydrate me because my body's trying to uh absorb the carbs in it and i'm not really like drinking as much as i should okay. um but I will use like, uh, I really like uh, EFS, their their hydration. Um, so I pretty much always train with that in my my bottles, um, regardless of the intensity of, of what I'm riding. Um, another thing that we do on long rides is I usually won't eat for the first hour. Uh, sometimes I won't eat for the first two hours um, just to kind of get my body going and burning through some of that fat and just like learning how to be a little bit more efficient. And then I'll start to eat after that. But, um, in an endurance ride, I'm aiming for like 80 grams an hour. Um, if I have any intervals or anything in there, then I'll bump up to like a hundred. And then if I'm doing like an intense workout, then I'll go up to 120 an hour. Um, awesome. and, and it totally changes. Like if I'm doing intense, intense workouts or, or high intensity training, then, then I'm using like more gels and, and, and I will put in a little more mix in my bottles and, you know, burn through those fast carbs a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. I was curious. I was like, man, rice, rice, and like thicker things for hard intervals to me. I'm like, I, no, I'm going definitely yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. Rice cakes only come <clears throat> along if it's like a pure endurance ride. Okay. Um, and then it's nice. Cause then you're just going zone two and like, you, you have some solid food you're eating. It tastes really good. Mm. Um, but yeah, if I'm going any harder than that, the, the rice will get clogged up in the throat and nose, and then you'll be choking and looking like an idiot, <laughs> which That's I do funny. often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's what? So then a race, super intense, especially gravel racing, just like full gas early on. What do you yep. do for that? Yeah. I kind of have a, this recipe of like, I'll, I said earlier, I don't do much carbs in my bottles, but I've found that if I do all carbs in my bottles for the first hour, I'm okay. So I'll mm -hmm. put hundred grams in my first bottle that I start with. And that'll last me an hour. Um, and then from there on, I'm basically just doing gels. And mm -hmm. um, I really like those never second gels. They have the best carb ratios, fastest, longest burning. Um, and pro tip, the citrus flavor is the one that goes down the easiest it's the mo it has like the best viscosity um all the others are a little bit chunky so i love the citrus flavor because it just goes down um i don't know if you're familiar with like a cyst gel but it's just like oh, yeah. that yeah you just basically you just swallow you just you know shoot it into your mouth and swallow <laughs> that sounds bad. This g rated g rated please g rated g -rate, yeah. we we uh those the I remember when Science and Sport first came out, it was like, whoa, this is like really liquidy. And they were a little bit bigger because it was so uh like the water content, I guess. But that was game changing from gels in like 2010 when it was just like very pasty, definitely needed water. Um yeah. 
I've switched over to maple syrup. I don't know if you've ever tried that before. I use it in like a reusable oh, yeah. flask, which has been, I've been super stoked about that. It's a little too sweet for some people, but that, and then my treat will be like candy usually is, uh, but I like the solid food idea for endurance. Cause I think it also too, like changes the mindset a little bit. Like you're going on an endurance ride. Don't go too hard today. It's like, oh, all right. yeah, exactly. If you're choking on rice, you're going too hard. Yeah, That's like, it's a measure for me. <laughs> What's uh, any supplements that you use? Yeah, I I'm using all sorts of supplements. Um, I think well, I have this daily vitamin pack that I take from the feed. It's just a feed formula. It has a, a bunch of different things that's been optimized for endurance athletes. Um, so I take that daily, and then uh, depending on where I'm at, like uh, leading up to a race, I'm using uh, Optogen HP from mm-hmm. EFS. Mm -hmm. um and then uh nitric oxide as well okay and i saw on one of your instagram things do you still have like a club on the feed or is there way athletes let's give a little plug here that they can connect with you or how do people do that or is there a link that we should put in the show notes or what's the best way to connect people with you on that yeah i'll send you over a link there's also a link in my instagram bio um i do have a nutrition club on the feed and um basically i i put what i'm using uh for each race on there so you can kind of see the exact products that i use um and then you also get 80 dollars a year um in in feed credit if you join so yeah awesome well people check that out we'll put the link down here or just check out his link in the bio when you follow cole on instagram what are you big into cycling tech Oh yeah. I'm oh yeah. Here. I love it. Okay. I'm all, I'm all in. <laughs> what's, uh, maybe what's unique about something that you like, or what are you biggest into like arrow or go in on that? Yeah. I mean, arrows, arrows, the popular thing these days. So we, uh, my buddy and I got super, super nerdy into arrow tech for, for Leadville, um, which is hilarious because it's a mountain bike race and, and we look like these, arrowed out time trialists going into it but it makes a difference there's, it makes a difference a i'm like over it nine makes a difference. Six, yeah. six i mean fast for you but like people trying to go sub nine is the number it's like that's a long race oh yeah yeah so i had uh arrow socks and gloves from asos and a skin suit and i mean mainly i'm using my arrow socks and gloves and skin suit in every race because why not like it's comfy and it's fast and it looks good i think um but yeah we a lot of the pros are now um taping their mountain bike handlebars like on the inside so you have another place to grab on that's really narrow like right next to the stem Mm. arrow bars are banned but um just moving your you know your your position in narrower is getting a lot more arrow um and then another shift at least in mountain bike tech is narrower handlebars Mm. i think for a while everyone wanted wider handlebars because they thought that like Oh, you'd have more control, more leverage. Um, but yeah, we're learning that narrower and narrower is it feels good, number one. And then also you're just always more arrow whenever you're hanging on, even when you're going downhill, it makes a difference. Um, so we chopped down our bars to 680, um, which is normal for for riders like 10 years ago. But um, I think just like three years ago, I was riding 740s. Okay. Um, wow. So it's substantially uh, narrower. Um, and then, yeah, I guess bigger chain rings too. Racing's getting so much faster. Um, chain rings are getting bigger and bigger. Lachlan Morton ran a 42 tooth on his mountain bike at Leadville. Keegan was on a 40. Um, and all I have is a 38, but even that's big for me. So, yeah, bigger chain rings, more aero. Um, just trying to get more speed in those, those faster sections. How, uh, I'm curious about the aero socks cause they've been coming up in the podcast quite often. Now, how do the ASOS perform in droopability? We'll call it, do they stay up or do you use glue hairspray, anything to keep them up? Any tips there? I didn't even know glue and hairspray was a thing. So Neither I did guess, not. I guess they're doing good. Yeah never had an issue yeah so i had a pair of aero socks from a company and i was like these things suck and so i threw them out and someone's like well what hairspray do you use i'm like excuse me they're like did you spray (laughs) hairspray or glue on them i'm like no and they're like that everybody uses that i was like i had no idea and so i've been asking i'm like very curious and so there are some brands that i've 
ask the people that run the company, like, so what's the tip here? And like, no, they should be good enough without it. Other people are no. And then there's other guys who are like, screw Aerosai. So it's just, it's been coming up on the podcast. And so I'm like, really curious. I'm going to have to check out the ASOS ones because the ones that I bought were good, but not perfect. So I'm going to, I made a note to, to look these ones Yeah. Up. Yeah. Check them out. They're, they're awesome. Super comfy too. So awesome. What's, uh, Asides from maybe arrow, what's underrated in cycling? Basically, being you know, like, what are some things that you're like? Well, I'm surprised more people just aren't into this. I think tire pressure, like Ooh, over I like and this. over again, man. Tire pressure is is huge, even in gravel too, or more so in gravel, honestly, because it's your suspension and your traction. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people feel like, oh, I'll put a little bit more pressure, and I'm going to roll quicker. Um, but, but really, I mean, the more pressure, it's just uh, maybe helping you prevent punctures in some cases. Um, but I've been doing a lot of testing on different pressures, and I've been so surprised at the lower I go, I'm actually getting faster. Mm. And, and it's crazy. At Unbound, I, I didn't have a great result there, but I was running like, in the 20s 25 27 psi how much do you weigh i'm uh, like 140 pounds okay so um so yeah and you you have more you it's way more comfortable you have way more traction uh i think if you think about it like over every bump if you have high pressure you're kind of getting bumped around Mm -hmm. um and you're not able to put down that power it's not like a if, efficient but if you have a little bit more give, then you, your bike stays planted on the ground and just kind of absorbs those bumps. And you can also like keep that continuous power going. Um, so I'm laughing because so obviously like, uh, man, this just shows my roadiness. Uh, I went to bliss for a gravel bike. I just had a lot of problems with it and I just didn't like the maintenance. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back to tubes. And so I was rocking tubes and doing about, 40 psi because i was worried i'm uh, 180 pounds so I'm like i'm gonna pinch flat if i go much lower and i can uh -huh. get away with it when it's like smoothish gravel and then i went up to virginia and i did a race um and i was with jeremiah bishop and it was definitely not smooth gravel it was had like a couple <laughs> of double track it wasn't mountain it wasn't super technical but it was enough that by three hours in my back was rocked and I was like, Oh, just like you said, all these little bombs. Yeah. And I was like, Oh yeah, my yeah. God, dude, I'm going back to two. This was a, this was a mistake. And then oh, I fired. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it didn't, yeah, didn't, it'll kill you. <laughs> didn't work. What is overrated in cycling? Oh, man. I, I don't, I get, I don't know. Like, I maybe narrow tires. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I've I've noticed that too a, a lot this year. I'm giving away all my all my secrets. I, this is good though. <laughs> Ted King said um, the same thing. He's like, bigger is always better. Yeah, bigger is so much better. Again, I've been doing tire testing, and like out of all my tires, the fastest ones on gravel were my 45s, yes. which are the biggest ones, and like. For so long, I was like, oh, I could get away with 35s here, you know, but like, it's not the case. It's slower over bumps and chatter, which happens a lot in gravel, even on the smooth stuff. It, it's just kind of holding you back and not absorbing. So yeah, I'd say, I'd say the bigger tires, bigger is better. Cool. I love that. Uh, can you finish this sentence? I never dot, dot, dot. Um, I... Hmm. I never raced a TT. Oh, okay. I like this. Is such an awkward mm. question that I've just kept in because people are like, I don't really get. The, I don't know where this is going. Uh, yeah, but that's yeah. Fair enough. No, will you ever get in the road? I don't know. Well, we'll see what Maybe. happens. Maybe. I, I mean, I definitely am a huge road cycling fan. Um. You did Tour and, de Bloom. Um, don't you do Tour de Bloom? I've done Tour de Bloom. I yeah. have, yeah. Yeah, I don't count that as much of a TT. I'm not, I, okay, I guess I've never ridden a TT bike. There, that That's the official one. Um, but 
yeah, I, I raced like when I was a junior and I, I think I, I made it up to cat three. Um, but yeah, I've never done a, a pro one, two race. So uh, maybe it would be fun. You know, never know. Do you get tired of the gravel, come over the road, come to the dark side. It's yeah. Yeah. No, it could be fun. It looks like a blast. It looks scary. It looks intense. But uh, yeah. So just don't watch the crit videos on YouTube. That's I know, right? Enticing. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I watch all of those. <laughs> what what so speaking of races, what race coming up uh for the for those we're recording this um, August 21st. We'll probably post it like later in September. What race are you looking forward to coming up? Yeah, I have so I'm my calendar is kind of centered around the Lifetime Grand Prix, which is you know a mixture of mountain bike and gravel races. Um, happens all year. Uh, Leadville was the fourth race, and the fifth stop is in uh, Wisconsin for the Schwamigan Forty, um, which is this kind of this iconic, long lasting point to point mountain bike race. Um, last year, the winning time I think was like an hour 36 so it's kind of back to my roots um shorter really tactical kind of intense mountain bike race and it's part of the grand prix so i'm stoked for that one um it, it's going to be super fun i'm i came back up to visit my family in washington to be training at sea level um because it's back at sea level and uh yeah i'm i'm stoked for it stoked to get on a, on a short race with the mountain bike did you win that last year no, I won it two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, you yeah. got to go back and, yeah, get that crown back. Yeah. yeah A lot of people were rooting for you. Yeah, what? Is... Couple last questions. Uh, I think, and this is one of those, like, doesn't have to be cycling related. What do you think? It doesn't have to be three. Top skills for success in life or cycling that you've sort of picked up along the way? Mm -hmm. Um, I think, like, consistency is a huge one just like keeping at it um yeah being consistent not over training um so you have to take time off avoiding injury um keeping it fun like i think that's a big a really big thing too about being consistent is like if you're enjoying it it's really easy to be consistent if you're like riding on the trainer all winter and like hitting your head against the wall, like that's just not going to happen. It's not sustainable. Um, so, so yeah, having fun, keeping it consistent, having good ride buddies for me, that's huge. Like um, it's, it's motivating for me to be with other people and like um, always pushing yourself. And like, I feel like you can learn so much from, from every different person that you ride with, even if you're better than them. Um, I'm like constantly inspired by, she is, I'll, I'll say she's better than me, my girlfriend, Sevilla. But, um, but yeah, she, she's like my, my number one OG ride buddy. And um, she's just always like inspiring me to, to get the best out of myself. So like surrounding yourself with, with those people that are going to bring you up. I think that's huge. That's awesome. I love that. And I really think, you make a really good point about sustainability. I love the science of cycling and the data, but I think sometimes, especially people that live in these areas where during winter, they might be stuck on Zwift and it's like, well, you know, I've read that it's not the physiological best thing for me to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm just going to do this really boring thing for four months and hate the bike afterwards. And I'm like, well, yeah. you know, what if you like, don't you want to enjoy this like that? Zwift race, don't do it every week, but yeah, go do that or go do this workout that you really like that might be a little bit too hard, but like it's keeping it fun for you. And then maybe take a step back and just you've kind of talked before about being nimble and in, in setting up your race schedule and how the training changes as you're traveling. I think it's so easy to get lost amongst like I got to always like we want to do the right thing for our training, but sometimes that's keeping it fun, as you're saying. So yeah. For athletes to hear that from you, someone's hit such a high level of sport. That's like just such a crucial gem. Um, you know, it sounds like you've got a really good balance of having fun, but taking the serious day serious. And uh, yeah, man, I really appreciate you sharing all that because it's just really not only educational, but like inspirational for people to just like keep going. And, you know, yeah, it's awesome. Any any last words for the people, any last words of wisdoms or things we maybe have missed that you want to share with uh, folks 
listening? Oh, man, I think we covered it all. Cool. I, I think like, yeah, I mean, back to what, to what you were just saying, I think it's like, it's so easy to, you know, everyone can push too hard. Like that's the easiest thing to do in our sport. And, and since we're cyclists, we are all like really good at suffering and we're all like wanting to get the most out of our bodies. But like the, where the real gains are made is like holding back and like making sure you're having fun and, mm-hmm. and enjoying it. And like, I came from a, a cold climate too in Washington where, you know, there were four months out of the year that you couldn't ride and like spent so much time indoors on rollers. And like, I wish when I was younger, I would have like leaned into some other things like, oh, maybe a cross country skiing instead of spending, you know, hours on the rollers or inside doing something different, then I'd be more motivated when, when the weather would get good to ride. Like, I think that's so important. That's a good tip. And actually when I, I was living in Rochester, so by Toronto and uh, Rochester, New York, and the thing of, I tried to lean into that. And then I realized in having to drive to go ski and like, they still have issues. Sometimes it was too icy or sometimes this or whatever. It made me appreciate the rollers a little bit more because I was, you know, uh, like I, once I went on, like, you know, it's actually not perfect over here. Maybe getting up and going and doing this three hour ride, staring at the freaking wall and watching like some TV show, there's no Zwift. This isn't actually that bad. So I think you're right. People like, as yeah. winter comes along maybe go try something else and you'll learn to appreciate what we've got um yeah yeah i don't know that's cool that's awesome well actually the last question is you're on instagram we're going to post that do you any other social media or where's the best way for people to follow along with you this season not strava do you blog twitter <laughs> or anything else the feed we'll put the feed thing in there sweet um, What's the best way yeah, to I have, keep up? I have a youtube channel that um i'm trying to get going um, okay it's not super consistent, but we're working on it. We're putting together a piece that should be out here in a few weeks. Um, yeah. That's kind of covering the last three races that I've done. And and, it, and the hope is just to kind of give you a peek behind the scenes um, of my season and, and all the different stops that we're doing. So we're working on getting that going, but right now, Instagram is the best place uh, to follow Wait. along. Follow on Instagram, go subscribe to him on YouTube and everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.